Father, we thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ. Father, that, that brazen altar where our sin was atoned for, where Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was placed upon that altar and raised up between heaven and earth, and our sin was placed upon him. Father, that place where your wrath for our sin was exhausted, completely poured out upon Jesus Christ, so that there is not one drop of wrath remaining for us. Jesus Christ cried out, Tetelestai, it is paid in full, it is finished. And Father, in Isaiah, the word of God, your precious word says, that you saw the travail of his soul and you were satisfied. So, Father, as we study the Word of God this morning, we look at salvation. Lord, please impress that deeply upon our hearts, God, that we would be changed by your love and grace, the unfathomable riches of your love and grace, God, that would transform us as we look at the cross of Jesus Christ and we look at his saving work and shed blood for us. We commit the service to you. We commit this Word to you. Please teach us now by thy Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so we have been focusing on the olive tree, uh, the good olive tree, and talking about the redemption of Gentiles, broken branches that have been grafted into the olive tree, which the roots of this good olive tree, this, this metaphor, were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the redemption, the justification that is by faith, and now the offspring of Abraham, the spiritual children of Abraham, include both Jew and Gentile. And we as Gentiles have been broken off of, of, uh, of a wild olive tree and grafted in. And now we partake of the fatness and the richness of the olive tree, which is all the riches, the eternal life, all the blessings that come by faith alone. We are children of promise. And so... Uh, we, we partake of the riches and the fatness just as Abraham did and was blessed of God because of faith. And you see that in Romans chapter 4 where it talks about the faith of Abraham and that he was justified by faith apart from any, any work or work of righteousness. And so now we as Gentiles who did not know God, we were alienated from the covenants and the promises of God. Now we've been grafted in. And now... So what about Israel, though? Because we see that Israel, the very people of God, have, have, have in large part been cast away. And so Paul is dealing with the condition of Israel. And uh, so we pick up in Romans 11, verse 25. And Paul writes, as he continues this, now he kind of moves on from the metaphor, but its application is still there. He says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So Paul again is revealing a mystery, a mysterion, uh, something that is veiled or hidden and has been secretive. And he doesn't want us Gentiles to be ignorant of this because if you're ignorant of the mystery, he says you'll be wise in your own conceits, in your own thinking in the, and, and in your own uh, understanding. If you don't understand this mystery, you'll think, you'll be, you'll be wise in your own conceits. In other words, uh, like he, he had warned before, that they were not to boast. Uh, verse 18, he says, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Um, thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. So there's a sense of pride, and he says, I want you to understand this, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So there is a partial blindness that has happened to Israel. Uh, now, in, in the sense of partial, it means it's not in totality. And Paul, of course, had said, has God forsaken uh, Israel? Has God cast away his people? He says, God forbid, for I myself am an Israelite. He says, so God clearly has not cast off all of his people. He's not cast off them that he has foreknown. And so the blindness in part is the majority. Right now it is the majority. But there is a remnant minority of Israel. And we talked about that. That remnant that is caused by election, they are not blind. Their eyes are open and they have received the fatness of the olive tree. But right now we're still in this phase of time where there is a blindness in part that has happened to Israel. 
we see that it is limited in its duration. That God is going to end this blindness uh, at the time that the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So it is limited in its duration, and we know it will go until, that blindness will come until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And, and, and this is, I've, I've kind of wrestled with this because uh, into the tribulation period, Israel is not restored. In other words, their eyes are not opened until the very end of the tribulation period. There will be three days of national mourning and repentance as God pours out His Spirit upon Israel. And their eyes will be opened and they will cry out to Jesus Christ to deliver them and all Israel shall be saved. That's the, the passage, of course, in Matthew chapter 24 that is taken so much out of context. It says, He that endures to the end shall be saved. Well, speaking of the Jewish people who endure to the end of the tribulation period, all Israel will be saved at the end of the tribulation period. Every Jew who remains at that final hour will be saved as God pours His Spirit out on Israel and they cry out knowing that Jesus is is in fact their Messiah. Their eyes will be opened. They will cry and mourn, and then they will cry out to Him to deliver, and all Israel will be saved. And so we know that at that point, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And to be honest, I've wrestled with this because, because um, Gentiles will be saved into the, tri in, in, into the Millennial Kingdom. And Gentiles will be saved throughout, uh, even though the church will be removed, which is predominantly Gentile, uh, I was reading through Revelation, and multitudes of Gentiles are going to be saved in the tribulation period. And so Gentiles will continue to be saved, and, and then that fullness will come in, and it will be uh, Israel's turn when God will turn back to them. So I've wrestled with this concept of, is the fullness of the Gentiles when the church is complete and the rapture occurs, or is it at the end of the tribulation period when multitudes of Gentiles will be saved in the tribulation period and then Israel is saved. I'm not really sure, but we know this, that the, 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 when the fullness of Gentiles has come in, that that blindness will be taken away and Israel will be saved. Now, as I was thinking about this blindness and again, the sovereignty of God, all right, the, that's why most people skip over Romans <laughs> chapter 9, 10, and 11 because it focuses on the sovereignty of God. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 and 11. Matthew 13, verse 10 and 11 says, And the disciples came and said unto him, unto Jesus, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Why do you do this, Lord? Matthew chapter 13, you'll notice that Jesus begins no longer to speak plainly to the multitudes, but he speaks in parables. And, and most times we think, Oh, well, he did the parables so that they could understand. No, he didn't. He answered and said to them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Jesus Christ spoke in parables to veil the truth to the Israelites, to conceal it from them, from the multitudes. And you see here the same principle. You have how many disciples here? You've got 12 disciples, and one of the disciples is an unbeliever. <laughs> so, so even in the 12, there's one who is uh, the son of perdition. He is uh, he's, uh, of the devil. Um, and, and you've got the remnant here that, that is granted to know. And what did Jesus do? He explained the parables to them, right? He taught the disciples... But to the multitudes, he gave the parables to conceal the truth. And notice this, because, why? Because it is given to you to know the, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Here is the sovereignty of God. To you I will explain, but not to them. You do realize that all of us deserve the wrath of God. All of us deserve his judgment, and therefore it is only by his grace that he chooses to reveal the truth to His elect, to those that He has chosen in mercy to set His love and mercy upon them, the vessels of mercy. And here the disciples are blessed to receive this understanding. But so this blindness goes back to, to this moment. Now remember, uh, Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 12 had performed a messianic miracle. 
And by this phrase, a messianic miracle, the rabbis had taught the people that when Messiah comes, one of the ways that he will be identified as Messiah is that he will do specific miracles that only Messiah can perform. And in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus of Nazareth fulfills one of those messianic miracles. If you come on Thursday night, you, you, you have the urge to ooh, 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 raise your hand. I know what that is. Maybe you don't have that urge. You want me to remind you what that is. But that miracle that he performed, that miracle that he performed was he cast out a demon from a mute. And the rabbis had taught when Messiah comes, he will be able to do this because the Jews, in order for them to cast out a demon, they had to know the demon's name. And so they would invoke the demon to speak his name, and then the Jews could, could have the power over the demon to cast him out. So they, 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 uh, they reasoned that when Messiah comes, he won't need to know the name, and so he will be able to cast a demon out of a mute. This occurs in Matthew chapter 12. It is a messianic miracle, and it is at the crescendo where the Pharisees have been evaluating Jesus if he is in fact the Messiah, and they have reached their decision. And now they've come together, they're ready to bring their indictment against Jesus Christ, and now he performs a messianic miracle, and the people around them are saying, Is not this the son of David? And this this reveals the fact that the people were anticipating when Messiah comes, he's going to do this. And this guy just did what we've been told Messiah will do. Is not this the son of David? Is not this the Messiah? And now the blindness is manifest. And they said, no, this is not the Messiah. He does not cast out demons by the power of God, but by the power of Satan. And when they spoke that blasphemy, that was the blasphemy of the un of the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin. It was a generational sin. Thank God it's not a sin we can commit. I was fearful. Thank God I was relieved of that fear. I was terrified I had committed the unpardonable sin years and years and years ago. And then finally, searching the Scriptures, I realized I couldn't commit the unpardonable sin. And oh, by the way, if I was afraid I'd committed the unpardonable sin, it was evidence I had not committed the unpardonable sin because the Pharisees didn't care. <laughs> Anyway, a little self-revelation there. Um, but I have, been, I have realized that many other people have had that same fear, that they've committed the unpardonable sin. This was a generational sin in the rejection of Israel's Messiah. And you see the blindness right there in Matthew chapter 12. And that blindness is part of the sovereign wisdom and knowledge of God. We're seeing it manifest even back in the Gospels when Jesus Christ is manifest Himself. This is part of the blindness that is, a, that is, that is a, a, an element of God's sovereign wisdom in bringing salvation to both Jew and Gentile. So we see that there, and we see in John chapter 8, verse 39 through 41, that the, the Pharisees are engaging Jesus Christ again, and that they answered and said unto Jesus, they said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if, if, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Now at this point he's revealing to them that they are the children of the devil. And so again, I point this out simply to say, number one, the Pharisees were the... the the descendants of Abraham, but only in the flesh. They were not the spiritual descendants of Abraham. And this is where Jesus challenges them. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But you, now you seek to kill me, a man that's told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. What did Abraham do when God spoke to him? He believed God's word. He believed in the Lord and his faith was counted as righteousness. But here the Pharisees who are boasting that Abraham is their father are rejecting not only the word of God as communicated, but the living word of God, the Messiah himself, in their very presence. And not only did they reject him, but they wanted to kill him. Jesus is pointing out here, and I, I, I list this, uh, this text to demonstrate 
They are the children of the devil. This is their default position. And again, I've mentioned this before. Because they've ingested the lies of their father, and they believe that the lies are the truth, they've exchanged darkness for light and light for darkness. In fulfilling uh, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. In doing so now, when Jesus speaks the truth to them, they assess that truth as a lie. They're in the bondage of their father and bondage to deception and lies. So they must, as, as we must, we are dependent upon the work of God to reveal the truth to us. And so God has simply allowed them to be who they are. And in the wisdom, the foreknowledge of God, you see, they had to crucify their own Messiah. And the only way that that would occur is if God allowed the blindness to exist so that they would reject and crucify and murder their own Messiah to fulfill the purposes of God. And that blindness we see is not only true today, but it goes all the way back to the time that Jesus was on the earth. In fact, he goes back even further. Because the Jews have constantly been in rebellion against the revelation of God. That's why they were cast around to the, to the four corners of the earth, because they had violated the law of Moses. They, they stoned the prophets, they killed the prophets that were sent to them. We read that this morning in Nehemiah. And so we see a, a very stubborn and obstinate people, but, but they're really a, a microcosm of, of all of us. It's only by the grace of God that we understand these things, that we know Christ. And so this is just addressing this blindness that is in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Now, let's look at the deliverer. God's going to send a deliverer to Israel. And so, verse 26 and 27, And so all Israel... All Israel shall be saved. All Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Now again, if you go back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, you can see the itemized work of God what he is going to do to bring salvation to the Jewish people. And this will come at the end of the tribulation period. In Daniel's uh, 70th week. But notice this. Look at these synonyms. First of all, a deliverer. All Israel shall be saved. A deliverer shall come out of Zion. You think in terms of a deliverer, and it speaks again of our inability to save ourselves. We need a deliverer. And the word deliverer is someone who rushes in to rescue. And he shall bring salvation. He'll turn away ungodliness from Jacob. These are synonyms. This is part of the deliverance process or salvation uh, of Israel. Um, I was listening to... Um, uh, I think I shared this on Thursday night or recently, but I was listening to one of my favorite YouTube channels, uh, this, this woman who is an evangelist, and she's constantly preaching the gospel of grace, and she made a great observation about a drowning man and relationship to the word salvation. You know, there are churches, there are individuals, and even ourselves, we're challenged or we're tempted to believe that you can lose your salvation. Well, really, to lose your salvation is an oxymoron. It's an impossibility. And she demonstrated this reality by, by uh, taking the example of a drowning man. You have a drowning man uh, in, in the ocean, and you see a lifeguard, and he sees the man drowning. And the lifeguard jumps in and swims out to the person and drags him back in and saves him. He's not going to die. He's been saved. And, and he, so he's in the newspaper, and he says, yeah, I saved this person. I went out and delivered them. They were drowning. I brought them to shore, and they're saved. And the guy's standing there, and, hey, man, you're my favorite buddy, man. Thank you so much, you know. Well, imagine if he had swam out there, and, and the story was different. He swam out there, and he grabs the person, and he's able to swim back for five minutes. And for five minutes, he keeps the guy's head above water. And he's like sputtering and coughing, but he's breathing, and he's... For five minutes, like, oh, good. But then the guy slips out of his hand in the sixth minute, and he drowns. Now imagine him getting to shore. Yeah, I saved that guy out there. I saved him. Well, for five minutes, I saved him. And then he slipped out of my hands. He drowned. 
Well, no one would say, well, you didn't save him then. He drowned. You didn't save him. Well, that's like saying the same thing about Jesus Christ. Oh, he saved me for six years. I was saved for six years. And then I fell away from Jesus and I lost it. I lost my salvation. You can't lose it. If you're saved, you're saved. If you're pulled to the shore and you're breathing, you're, you're saved. It's a done deal. And so it is with the deliverer of Jesus. He rushes in and saves us. It's all of him. We're free. And folks, you know, we've got to allow this to soak deep into our heart and transform our thinking. Because really, it puts a pep in your step and joy in your heart when you know that I am saved. I have eternal life. I can't perish. I can't perish. Nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And nothing means nothing. And saved means saved. I have a deliverer. And, and look, a drowning man doesn't help. Here, uh, I'm going to swim with my hands and you swim and kick with your feet and we'll both make it to shore. That never happens. In fact, a lot of times, I, I've heard before, they have to knock the person out in order to save them because they'll, they're panicked. They'll pull both people down and drown. So he's like, you've got to lay still and let me do the work. That's what Jesus Christ has done, our deliverer. And again, the very phrase itself, a deliverer and salvation, doesn't that really point to Jesus Christ? He's done it all. He's our Savior, our Deliverer. Let's rest in that wonderful truth. So, so I'm applying these things to us, but it's true of all Israel is going to be saved. Now notice this again, the sovereignty of God. You know, I've mentioned before, uh, after the rapture of the church, God is going to seal 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Now, of course, it begs the question, if the church is still here in the tribulation, why would he have to, to seal Jewish evangelists? The church would still be here. We would still be carrying on the Great Commission. No, the church is gone. That's why he has to seal the Jews. And now his focus is back on Israel, the time of Jacob's trouble. So these Jews are saved. 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes. Folks, that doesn't just happen by chance. Woo, imagine that. 12,000 just happened to believe in Jesus out of the tribe of Benjamin. Oh, 12,000 just happened to believe out of the tribe of Judah. Oh, and that all happened at the simultaneous, the same moment. No, God is sovereign. God is causing the salvation of these people. He's pouring out His Spirit and saving them according to election, according to His will. And so it is with the salvation of Israel. It's not just going to be happenstance. Oh, you think Jesus is Messiah? I don't believe that. You know, in the last days, they're all going to believe because God's going to pour His Spirit upon them. Their eyes will be opened. The sovereignty of our Deliverer. All Israel will be saved. Now notice this part of salvation is turning away ungodliness from Jacob. Now again, you look at Israel today and, and look at the Orthodox Jew. And you would say, oh, that's a very pious people. As I mentioned before, when you go to the Wailing Wall... Oh, shh, these are very holy people. They're praying. Now, certainly I don't want to be disrespectful at the Wailing Wall, but I've shared this before. The Lord just kind of impressed upon my spirit as, as they were praying and reading their prayer book and going through the ritual at this Wailing Wall, at the western wall of the Temple Mount. And they were the holy ones. They had the curly, you know, the long, the, the long, um, what are those called? Sideburns and and the hat and the garment and the prayer and the book and everything. The Lord showed me as I was there in my, in my uh, you know, shoes and, and shorts and my you know, tourist hat and everything. I am the Holy One, not them. But not because I'm good. They're the ungodly. They have refused and rejected the righteousness of God. They have continued to choose their own righteousness. No, I will not receive my Messiah. I have my prayer book and my, and my garments and, my, and this and... And they are ungodly. God's going to turn that ungodliness away. But the world would look at that and say, Oh, this is piety and holiness. Look at these holy men as they worship God. God would have none of it. None of it because they've rejected the righteousness of God. He's going to turn that away from, from Israel. All that ungodliness. And of course, all the other things that we know are ungodly. That, that you know, I mean, we talked about... Uh, Tel Aviv being, you know, the LGBTQ capital of the world in some ways, uh, where that is embraced, and and Jesus or the Word of God calls Jerusalem uh, equates it to Sodom, and we see that being fulfilled today. Um, 
And you shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So here's another synonym. These things are all part of salvation or deliverance. He turns away ungodliness and he takes away their sins. See, this is the key. Salvation is not being given a set of rules to stop sinning, but that God has done a work for us through Jesus Christ that actually takes away, it removes our sins. So I thought of Psalm 103, verse 11 and 12. David again writing, he says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. Now think about this. We've got the Hubble telescope, right? As far as I know, I haven't been to NASA's page in a while, but as far as I know, the Hubble telescope has not seen the end of the universe. Has, there's not that great wall where it's like, oh, that's it, there's the end of the universe. Now think about what God is saying. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. God has a riches of mercy that's unfathomable. And mercy is what's given to those who deserve judgment when they get mercy. In fact, remember the, the publican and the, the, the Pharisee and the publican when they went and prayed? And the publican prayed, Oh Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like other men like this guy, this publican. And the publicans were vile people in, in the Jewish community because they worked for the enemy, for Rome, and they extorted their own people of taxation as they, as they uh, collected taxes for Rome and then skimmed some off for themselves. They were despised. And the, the, the publican came in. He smote his breast. He said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Now here's this despised man. He said, Lord, be merciful to me. Now, if God had a limited amount of mercy, it would be questionable. Does God have enough mercy? Can He scrape up enough mercy for this wretched, defiled man who was despised of the people and who betrayed His own people for the Romans to, just to, uh, to, to, to save His own neck? But we see that the mercy of God is as high as the heavens are above the earth. There's no limit to the mercy of God. Salvation requires the mercy of God, and God is rich in mercy toward them that fear Him. So, have you had a rough week? Have you sinned again? Have you sinned again? You know, I had a, I had a really rough week. I had a, I had a real knockdown, drag out fight with my son. Now we didn't get physical, fortunately. Thank God it didn't. But man, we were going at it. it was, He's back in my house, and <laughs> there's a clash going on there. And it was ugly, and it went on. And, and just other sins accumulated in the week. And, I, and then, oh, and oh, by the way, I just had my holy sabbatical, too. I should have been, I should have been super spiritual and holy. I had my sabbatical. I'm, I'm gonna be, I got enough holy glow to last you know, past Sunday, right? Well, I'm, apparently I didn't get a whole lot of holy glow because we had this big clash. And it was, and it was. I'm sure that I'm sure in the state, in the ward house, they're talking about it this week because it was, oh, it was public. Uh, we weren't hiding anything. And um, you know, the flesh will come in, and Satan. That's when Satan will begin to fire these darts and say, he'll fire at us and, and and say, oh, look what you've done, and bring accusation to our heart. And again, it's all legit. It's all legitimate accusation. He's not making anything up. It's all laid out, and I know it's all true. And the problem is, if we turn into ourselves and we try to answer that in our own righteousness, we're going to find depression and despair because we've got nothing to answer that with, right? I've got nothing to say, oh no, I didn't sin in that exchange. No, you did sin, and he's itemized the sin, and he's firing these darts of accusation into your heart. And that's why we have to put on the righteousness of God. That's the armor that we put on. It's not my righteousness. It's not my righteousness that I stand here as a pastor. It's not my righteousness that I'm going to heaven. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to me as a gift. Out of mercy. It is the mercy, this mercy that mounts up, that is greater than the exchange that I had with my son. Amen. His mercy is greater. His mercy is greater. His mercy will always be greater. Because as the heavens are high above the earth, so is His mercy. Even so, 
So great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. What does it mean to fear Him? It means I've recognized I've sinned against God and, and I need a Savior. If He doesn't deliver me, then I'm going to be judged by God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you recognize, and I did as a kid, man, I was constantly under the condemnation of God. I was aware of my sin, and I could not find a way out. Every way I turned, everywhere I turned, I could not find a way out to escape my own guilt before God. And I was terrified of hell. I was afraid of hell. And God used that fear to lead me to His grace when I received it at the age of 16. So His mercy is... is is abundant. It's, it's beyond abundant. He's rich, abundantly rich in mercy. I wrote down some words. How about copious mercy, right? How's that? Copious. Copious. Google that. That's a, that's a good word. Uh, how about superfluous? Superfluidity. Uh, Hyperabundance. Superabounding grace and mercy. Um, now notice this, that it brings... Forgiveness. Mercy is going to bring forgiveness. And forgiveness is, is, again, this is the key. You have to have your sins removed. That's what forgiveness is. I have to have my sins removed from me. And this is what the mercy of God does. John, 1 John 1, 7 tells us the means whereby God mercifully removes sin in the process of forgiveness. He removes it from our spirit. It says, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. Now this is a verse that applies to believers as we walk with Jesus Christ, okay? And this is really wonderful. This is a verse that deals with fellowship, it's not dealing about with salvation, but the truth is the same, that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, the, the context of the passage here is, so, so here's our, our normal life, okay? So, I'm walking along, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, I'm not just a Christian, I'm a super Christian, I'm a pastor Christian, Woo! And I have this massive blowout that the whole neighborhood sees. <laughs> And it's not pretty. It's not, let's just say it's not pastoral. It was not pastoral counsel that I was giving my son. And vice versa. Um, and so, um, so here I am walking along and I stumble and we have this knockdown drag out. Okay. Now I confess that sin. 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, it means agree with God about what you just did was wrong. It's a sin. I agree with you, God. That's a sin, what I just did. And I confess it in that agreement. <coughs> he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, we do not have to go and confess every sin. One of the things that Martin Luther did that was so burdensome, his priests, oh, it's Martin Luther, I was going to get out of the box in five minutes, and there's Martin Luther, hey! <laughs> Martin Luther was going to confess for hours. <laughs> That was his thing. Like he, he was so burdened with guilt before he came to Christ. He literally would have confession for like up to eight hours confessing every little strain of sin that came into his mind because he did not want to die. He felt the wrath of God upon him. So he's trying to confess everything, but it's never satisfied. Folks, that's not how we live. Thank God. Do you have a knockdown blow? Then confess it to God. And guess what? You, you see a spot on your arm here. This is how I had it described years ago. You see a spot and say, oh, Lord, look at this. There's a spot there. And he cleanses that. But what you don't see is a spot on your back. Oh, and he cleanses that too. When you confess what you see and know, he cleanses you of all unrighteousness. That's how we walk in fellowship with Jesus Christ. That's why I can get back up here today, even though I had that fight with my son. And I can stand in here in the pulpit today and preach the Word of God. Because I'm still in fellowship with Christ. I confess that sin and move forward. And thank God. But, oh, by the way, that's an every week thing, by the way. It's not just one week when I have a big blow on my son. It's, it's every week. I'm not, I can't stand in this pulpit in my own strength, okay, and bring the Word of God. I'm not worthy to do that. But I walk in fellowship. He cleanses me of all sin. I have a conscience that, again, I pillow my head at night, and my conscience does not bother me. I have a clear conscience before God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that is in the application of fellowship with God. 
Okay, but in the terms of salvation, that moment of salvation, this principle is indispensable. This is the means whereby God is able to separate sin from the sinner. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Notice it says all sin. It says all sin, not the petty sins. You know, just the sins that we normal folk, good, good tax-paying American sins. We're not talking about, oh, but the big sins. Oh, that's, oh, you've got serious issues there, you know. No, it says all sin. That's what it says. All sin. All sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So look at this. The word cleanse, to purge. To purge. It cleanses. The blood of Jesus Christ is the agent whereby God cleanses or purges all sin. Do you know that bead rubbing will not purge you of your sin? Do you know that bowing, turning toward a certain direction will not cleanse one sin? It won't cleanse one sin. Do you know that putting an extra dollar in a plate will not cleanse a single sin? It won't even begin to, to wipe it away. It has no power to do that. This is why it is so critical that we must know the truth because it's only the blood of Jesus Christ that will remove sin. And if your sin is not removed, you'll be cast away from God in the lake of fire. We must be forgiven of our sins and we must have the proper cleansing agent which is the shed blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that will separate our sin from us. It's the only thing that will take away that argument, that fight with my son, that will wash it away and I can still stand before God in righteousness and holiness and know that I'm going into heaven. Because not because I behaved and because I tapered back and held my tongue, but because the blood of Jesus Christ has separated that sin from me. Amen. Hallelujah. That's good news, people. Yes. That's good wow. news. Because, folks, we got a litany list of sins. You're not standing up. I'm, I'm standing up sharing mine. But there are some sins I'll never share from this pulpit. Never, 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 never. I will go to my grave with those sins, but Jesus Christ has washed them away. Because the blood of Christ washes all sin. All of it. Now, cleanse sin, cleanses all sin. Now, so sin, think about a stain. Think about cleansing, think about a stain. The Word of God says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. So we're talking about a stained soul, stained with sin. So there's a stain. The word stain means, listen to this, a discoloration produced by foreign matter. So sin is that foreign matter that's gotten into our soul and stained it. It's that foreign matter. Having penetrated into or chemically reacted with a material. So here is sin. It's been entered into our soul, our spirit man. And now that sin has reacted spiritually with our spirit. And it's brought death. And it, it, it is, it, it's ingrained in us now. It's brought death. It's chemically, spiritually reacted with our spirit and brought about the product of death to us. It separated us from God. And it says, and, and the word means a stain is a spot not easily removed. It's not easy. What did the word of God say? Who has seen your arm? Who has the arm of the Lord been manifest, been revealed to? It took the Lord Jesus Christ becoming a man, God becoming a man, to take away the sin. God had to die upon the cross and shed His blood for my sin. He died for my sin. It took the bearing of His right arm of power. Well, I'm, I'm flexing my left arm. But it was His right arm of power. It's a spot not easily removed. You see, the blood of bulls and goats and all that stuff couldn't, all of that stuff and that labor and building the temple and maintaining the temple, none of that could take away sin. But it was a foreshadowing of the thing, the great work that God would do in taking away my sin. Me, Ron Tabor, an individual. The discoloration was produced by sin upon my soul and produced death. Jesus Christ came to remove that stain. And that's what he did. See, religion cannot remove that stain. Religion can't. Sitting through this sermon can't take away that stain. None of this can. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can remove it. Now the word purge, purge, uh, I've got here, to remove by or as if by cleaning. So this is the thing. Um, how many people use Febreze? You ever use some Febreze? Yeah, we use it. We've got pets, so we'll use it. We'll use other little deodorants and stuff. You ever put deodorant on, you know? Um, 
You can't have deodorant. See, religion is deodorant. Religion is the Febreze that kind of, this just takes the, this just kind of cover the stench. Right? That's what religion does. This kind of, this kind of cover the stench. No, that's not good enough. It must be removed. The particles of sin, the stain of sin that's not easily removed, that spot, it has to be completely removed. The particles that cause the stain must be individually, every single one of them must be removed, not spritzed over, not perfumed over, just so you can't see it because God sees our sin. You can't perfume your sin before God. It's all in the book, so everything we've thought, done, said, we're going to give account thereof if we do not believe in Jesus Christ. We don't have the blood of Christ. And so again, that's why it's not that, you know, um, you know, it's been brought up in times past. I've shared this before. Uh, uh, we've had this question raised recently. Um, why, why are you so critical of other religions? Why are you so critical of them? Well, I'm critical because if you trust in them, you're just going to have a spritz. You're just going to have a Febreze over your sin and will remove your sin. And you'll die thinking you're good with God. In fact, you're not good with God. And it's too late. See, you must know the truth. The truth will set you free. You've got to know the truth. If you die in your sins, you will be separated from God. And so the same question, oh, oh so you're saying because, uh, you know, because I believe this religion, I'm part of this religious system and all that, I'm going to go to hell because I'm in this religious system. No, that's not why. You're going to go to hell because that religious system cannot remove your sins. It's promising something that it's not going to perform. Now, now imagine, I mean, we expect in the, in the normal realm, you know, if, if I go to, if I know that, you know, the, the car dealership down the street, the guy sells lemons, he's a deceiver and a liar, and I've got a good friend who wants to go and buy a car and says, hey man, have you noticed how cheap those cars are? And I'm going to go buy one of those good cars that are cheap. I'm like, wait a minute, dude, let me tell you about this guy. You'd want me to tell you. If I knew he was a charlatan, you'd want me to tell you to save you from buying a lemon. How much more in eternal life thing, in things that matter eternally? It's incumbent upon us to tell our loved ones, folks, if you continue this path, you'll die in your sins because there's no atoning sacrifice. The blood of Jesus Christ is not applied. Only the blood can cleanse or purge the sin. To remove it, the particles of sin must be removed by the blood of Christ. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when you put all this together, and we know that all Israel will be saved, we realize that the Jews will have to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. There is no other way. You know, the Jews will be saved on their own, just automatically, but Gentiles have to believe in Jesus. No, it's very clear. There is no salvation. There is, there is neither salvation in any, any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby, whereby we must be saved. Okay. Now, I was going to go on and talk about without repentance. That's the whole title of the sermon, which is the next verse. Um, let's look at this. We'll just touch on this and we'll, we'll get back into it next week. Romans 11, 28, 29. As concerning the gospel... They are, the, the, the Jews, are the enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. They're irre irrevocable. Okay? So, a few observations here. First of all, they are enemies. The Jews are enemies for your sakes. Now, I went back to Matthew chapter 13 and the, the rejection of the Messiah by Israel, the rejection of their own Messiah, and of course that was essential. Messiah had to be uh, to be crucified. He had to be the sacrifice for our sins, and therefore it was necessary that Israel reject their Messiah so that he could fulfill the purposes of the Lamb of God, shedding his blood to take away the sins of the world. Okay. Now in Acts chapter 1, verse 8... I'm going to look at these two, two uh, passages to show the practicality of this, uh, of the wisdom of God. Notice, look at Acts 1.8. Now Jesus is, is, of course, raised from the dead at this point. It is moments before his ascension into heaven, and it is before the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God is poured out upon the believers and the disciples. Verse 8 says, Jesus speaking, he says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. 
and you shall be uh, witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Yeah. Notice the direction away from Jerusalem that the gospel is going. Now think about this again, that the power of the Holy Spirit, again, I mentioned this so many times, but it's, it's always worth bearing, you know, repeating. We live, you spin the globe, I mean, it's, it's a long flight to Jerusalem, trust me, okay? You're going to want to watch a movie or two, and you're going to take a few naps and want to snack on stuff. You're not going to land in five hours, it's going to be more like 15 hours, and that's from New York. Yet the gospel has, has crossed the ocean, and here we are in Ogden, Utah, and we take it for granted. We take it for granted that we can open up the Word of God today and hear this message. But isn't that what Jesus said would happen? You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. So not only are we removed by literally thousands of miles from, from the work of Jesus Christ physically on the earth, but we're removed by over 2,000 years from this event. The Spirit of God has given power to this message, and here it is today. But notice the direction away from Jerusalem to the uttermost part of the earth. Now turn over to Acts chapter 8, verse 3 and 4. We'll close on this verse. They're enemies. They are enemies for your sakes. So how is this going to be fulfilled? Look at Acts chapter 8, verse 3 and 4. As for Saul, this is, you know, this is before he's the Apostle Paul. He is Saul the persecutor and the hater, despiser of Jesus and the church. It says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. So there is persecution, and the tip of the Jewish persecution, the spear of Jewish persecution, is a man named Saul Tarsus. He is the point of the spear of persecution against the church. Of course, now he's the <laughs> irony of irony is the sense of humor of God. Now he's not only an apostle of Jesus Christ, but he's an apostle to the Gentiles, which he could not he couldn't stand the Gentiles as, as a Pharisee. Therefore. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Notice because Saul was an enemy of the gospel, that the gospel went out further than Jerusalem, and they're preaching the word. They weren't going to preach the word until the persecution came. They weren't being obedient, saying, you know, uh, Shmuley, the Lord has told us that we were to take the gospel to the to the uttermost parts of the earth. So why don't we go ahead and pack up and let's go to Ogden, Utah. We're going to go there. I don't know where that is, but we're going to take a ship and go there and preach the gospel. No, they were content where they were. And so the hatred, the enemies of the gospel and the Jewish people compelled and forced the gospel out, out, out. And now it's come, it's blanketed the whole world and here we are as Gentiles. I just wanted to point this out to see what this means. They're enemies for your sakes. It, it, it was a blessing to the Gentile people that the Jewish people rejected the gospel and to this day do. But that is going to change. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, we are amazed at your, at your wisdom as we see this unfold, Father. And, and Lord, you've, you've been given one lump. One lump of humanity in Adam all have sinned and in Adam all die because all have sinned. But Father, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, has come that all may have life and forgiveness and, and, and that mercy, Father, that, that is descriptive of your heart and your character, God, is manifest and the substance has been, has been given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And his sacrifice, his death, his burial, his resurrection, Father, is the good news, Lord, that brings eternal life to all mankind, whether Jew or Gentile. And so, Lord, it is, it is a deep and profound thing, God. We thank you for the revelation of this mystery. We thank you for the understanding. And we thank you, God, for the admonition that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, to pray as Paul did for his brethren in the flesh, God, that they might be saved. And, Father, we thank you that we know that that prayer will be answered. It is not a prayer of vanity, God, but a prayer that will be answered, Lord, when all Israel shall be saved and the multitudes of the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 
will be saved, both men and women, young and old, God, you will redeem them all. And Father, we look forward to that day. And we thank you, God, that in the meantime, that the gospel message has been brought to us, and you have grafted us into the olive tree. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, God, we receive life and the fatness, uh, God, of justification by faith, of eternal life, forgiveness of sins. Lord, we look forward to experiencing the fullness of that blessing, God, in eternity, in the kingdom and beyond. Father, we thank you and give you praise for your grace. In Jesus' name.